Uh, I didn't start in marketing. I did not go to school for marketing. I went to school for finance. I've done nothing with finance. I was working in a donut shop. So I was waking up at three o'clock in the morning and going making donuts. And so I did that for two years and then moved over to Dataman to run all of marketing. And we got recently got acquired by IBM. This was my first exit as a startup to one of the most well-known brands in the world. That's how I basically got from working in a donut shop to where I'm at today. In this episode, I'm talking to Ryan Yackel, CMO of Databand.ai. They're helping modern data teams detect bad data instances earlier and resolve them faster. We'll talk about how this four-year-old company raised $14 million in capital, how they focused on content and messaging to acquire Fortune 100 companies, and the three main pillars of their GTM strategy, which ultimately led them to getting acquired in July 2022 by IBM. We're also going to try to figure out the valuation of that acquisition and how much they actually spend in marketing. And if he can't answer a question, we both had to take a shot of hot sauce. Wish me luck, Martians. Hope you enjoy this one. Hello, hello, Martians. Welcome back to another Another episode of Marketing on Mars. I believe this is episode 39 or 40. I, I lost track. Today, we are joined by Ryan Yackel. He's currently uh, the Chief Marketing Officer at Databand.ai. Uh, basically, Databand is, uh, is a company that's helping modern data teams detect bad data um, and uh, detect them earlier and also resolve uh, these instances uh, faster. Um, they've raised a little bit of money, I believe it's 14 million or something like that. We'll, we'll get the exact number from Ryan in a little bit, if he can share it. Um, and, um, and they recently got acquired by IBM, um, and that's public knowledge. So, uh, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. You, you, you got it. I think, think you got it pretty good about what we do. It's pretty, pretty simple. Bad data flows through data pipelines and data sets. We help you understand exactly where those issues are, uncover those, and tell you exactly where to go solve them with data observability. So you can be one of our spokesmen, you know, you could uh, come over here and be on the marketing team. If you want to. <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 bring my, I'll bring my hot sauce. I'll get, I'll get everyone to take shots of hot sauce and yeah. we'll, we'll go down that way. But uh, be, look, before we get into Databand and all that stuff, we want to learn a little bit about you. Who is Ryan? Tell, tell us a little bit about where you're from, uh, your, 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 your backstory and how you know, your career progressed and got, uh, and got you to where you're at today. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And thanks for having me on the, the, uh, the call here. I'm really um, nervous about this little spoon I have here, which uh, I know we're going to have to put some hot sauce on it here in a minute. Um, but yeah, my, uh, <laughs> my, my, uh, path to where I'm at today is a little bit interesting. Um, I'll try to keep it as short as possible, but, uh, I didn't start in marketing. Um, I think a lot of people end up in mm. marketing that don't start in marketing. Uh, but uh, I did not right. go to school for marketing. I went to school for finance. I've done nothing with finance really, except for using Excel macros to figure out budgets and stuff. But um, uh, so I graduated in 2010. I uh, always said I want to be a soccer coach. Then I realized that I don't think that I like the whole being away from the family a ton, being on travel, mm. going to games, and then. Um, you know, I, I just didn't, uh, it was more of a hobby for me than, a, than, a, than a career. So, uh, graduated during 2010, mm -hmm. obviously not the best time, uh, during the world at the time we had kind of the great recession going on. So I was working in a, yeah. uh, coffee shop in a donut shop. So I was waking up at three o'clock in the morning and going making donuts with my brand new college degree. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Got to learn a lot <laughs> about uh, small business and those, those people have it tough out there. Right. I'll tell you why. I learned a huge appreciation for, mm. for that. Um, and then somehow I got roped into uh, being a software tester uh, for a company called CGI, which is a Canadian company. I know you're up, you're up in uh, Canada mm. today. Uh, so yeah. I was there for about yeah. two years and then I transitioned from there into uh, doing software testing for a company called Macy's. Uh, if you've heard of it, it's a furniture store, pretty big yeah. furniture store, Macy's yeah. Day Parade yeah. and Thanksgiving. And so I did that for a while. And then there's this company called QA Symphony. This is my first time getting into startups where they were basically looking for people uh, that had experience in the software testing space, but it could be basically a sales right. engineer. So I used to be a software tester. I know how the lingo is. I know what they say, what they don't say, how they interact with development. And we were selling mm. at that company, we were selling a test management company. We we're selling a test management software. and so. 
back in 2014 is when I got my I got bit by the startup bug, so to say, and I joined this company. QA Symphony was our first sales engineer there. So I did that for uh, about about two years and then transitioned over to product marketing. We had um, one of my uh, my bosses at the time, Jeff Perkins. He he was basically using me to figure out uh, website copy and messaging and doing webinars mm. and doing data sheets and solution right. briefs and basically helping out the marketing team. And I said, hey, I, I kind of want to get out of doing sales engineering. Can, can I join the marketing team? And that's how I got into product marketing. So from there, I, mm. I was a global director uh, of QA Symphony and also a company called Tricentis when we merged uh, into becoming one company for test automation. And then after that, I went to a company called Key Factor, which does security, IAM security for machine identities. I ran product marketing and content over there for two years and then moved over to Dataman most recently uh, to run all of marketing. And like you said in the beginning, we got recently got acquired by IBM. So this is my first exit as a startup uh, in the startup space. And it's one of the most you know well-known brands in the world. So it was been kind of a wild ride, but uh, that's how I basically got from working in a donut shop to where I'm at today. So, yeah, and it's been it's very cool. Like you've 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 been at a variety of different roles. So, and and everything that you learned kind of prog- in, in progression uh, led you to where you're at now at, at Databand, and you guys are doing crazy crazy things. Obviously, now you're part of the IBM family. Yep. So we're gonna get into all of that. Um, but uh, yeah, and everything led you to today where we're going to be taking shots of hot sauce. That's, that's, so your life is just always going up, I know. constantly going up. I know. I'm very nervous. <laughs> I am actually nervous. I used to drink. I used to love hot sauce. I still love hot sauce. But as I've gotten older, I feel like my body is like screaming at me to stop putting as much hot sauce as you can on things. And so I've got I've got some hot sauce Damn. here. I've got it. I'm ready to go. I'm going to do All it. All right. What, what do you have? All what right. So I've got a today? I've got a. Uh, family of brands here. Uh, we've got the regular Tabasco, which I know this is a wimpy way to do it. We've got the even milder Tabasco, which is the jalapeno. And then we've got the <laughs> oh, no. the spicy, spicy one, which again, isn't insane, but it's the habanero one. So I'm assuming you want me to take the habanero one. I think so, we're going to do that. Yeah, we're right. going to do that. We're going to do that. All, all right. right. Let's do that. Which one do you by have? Way, what do you by have? The way, how... Okay. So I have... Um... I have this one from Korea. I think I, uh, when we first met, I was in Korea. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it's just like a hot. I think it has capsation with some, but it's mild. It doesn't have okay. a lot of capsation. So it's not too, too spicy, but it is spicy. Yeah. Um, it's like I'm sweating already. All right. Are we doing this? Cheers. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Oh! Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, uh, I didn't eat any food. I had a few pieces of chips before this. You saw. Uh, me, I but- did see that. Yes, you're you're quickly trying to get some carbs in there for yourself. <laughs> I'm gonna have I'm gonna have one piece of chip. <laughs> one more piece of chip. Um, first hot sauce question. How old are you? Uh, I am thirty. I'll be thirty five this year. So 35. Yeah, okay. I've got two girls, one girl, another girl on the way. So I got three girls come come March 15th. So it's uh I'm outnumbered here at the house big time. Uh and my dog is also yeah. female, so it's all tough. No, oh, you're the oh man, you need some some more testosterone. I know, right? Um <clears throat> but yeah. Okay, cool. So you, you pass the first question. Uh, I guess let's talk a little bit more about Databand yeah. before we dive into marketing tips and how you guys grew and all that. Yeah. So Databand, you, you kind of gave us like a short uh, intro on what it does. Um, but maybe you can explain a little bit more about how you guys make, how you guys make, like what's your business model yep. and some other um, you know stats behind or, or facts behind Databand. Yeah, so the... The way to think about data band is if you think about tools in the marketplace that you're maybe people may have heard of um, companies like Datadog, New Relic, these are uh, publicly traded companies out there on the market today. Dynatrace, I think they're publicly as well. What they basically do is if you have an application, say you have a website, you're running a website, mm-hmm. 
and or let's say it's a it's more of an application that's in the cloud and you're running that like Zencaster would be an example. We're recording this on Zencaster right now. They probably have a lot of right. monitoring and observability that's hooked into their platform to tell what's going on on the platform as Ryan and Simon are communicating. There could be a service down, there could be a security mm. issue, there could be a certificate that's not renewed. All that is telling the people behind the curtain who is over at, you know, Zencaster on their data or their DevOps team. They're looking and monitoring and make sure these things aren't breaking. And if they do break, they need to go and figure out ways to restore back to uh, uh, restore services as, as soon as possible, right? Well, if you take that same concept mm-hmm. and you just you don't apply it necessarily to application infrastructure, but you apply it to data pipelines and data that's flowing in through different sources, that's what DataBand is doing. You have hundreds to mm-hmm. thousands to hundreds of thousands of pipelines and runs that you're constantly consuming from a data engineering perspective, data science perspective, data analyst perspective, all this data has to go from one location to another to be presented in a way either in dashboards or analytics or a data product, for example. And we need to, they, people need to know right away if something breaks or goes down or it could halt something mm. going downstream. And so that's what DataBand does. It, we tie directly into data pipelines, data sets, data tables within your warehouse. And we'll say, hey, there's a there's a problem here. There's a break here. Uh, data team, go fix it. Let me tell you exactly where to go fix it with root cause analysis. So that, that's basically what data band does. And it, it's come out of this need in the market that's from mm. the observability side that was traditionally catered towards the DevOps group, software engineers. And now what we're doing is we're catering more to the data teams, the data ops teams, data engineers, not software engineers, and the mm. whole data team that's orchestrating all the data going on in your, your organizations today. So if you look at mm. some of the biggest IPOs that have ever happened recently in recent history, what were they? Well, all of them were data companies. So we're, it, that shows you kind of the importance of, of making sure that your good quality data is, is, is delivered in a trustworthy manner. And we help you detect things and resolve them right away. Yeah, totally. And if you look at our day to day, um, not just, you know, marketers, but just anyone, uh, especially people that are listening, our whole lives are driven by, you know, social uh, apps and social media platforms and websites and yep. all of that. Guess what? It's all data, right? Everything that you do is data. Um, what kind of companies do you typically work with? I mean, if you're working with data teams, I'm assuming they're going to be larger, you know, more to the enterprise or medium to large size companies. Uh, but I don't know, like who are your ICPs or, you know, you target? Yeah. Audiences? So for, for a company size, it re- the company size isn't really a part of our ICP, meaning that um, it's not like we okay. have, uh, w- there's a certain uh, size of company that would only use our software, a certain industry that would only use our mm. software. Basically, if you're using data, and you have a data engineering team and you're using tools that encompass like the modern data stack, which include things like Apache Airflow, Databricks, Snowflake, mm-hmm. DBT. Right. DBT is a huge uh, uh, company that's you know valued at over six, $6 billion now, I believe. Um, if you're using all these tools mm-hmm. to basically take your data, transform it, and then have it consumable, you need something in place that's that's basically monitoring that whole infrastructure to tell you when things go bad because you don't have you don't have the bandwidth mm. nor do you have the you know the manpower to really sit there and monitor and watch all of these hundreds of thousands of pipelines that you have and so from a perspective of like our ICP our ICP is really is really related to if you have certain technologies in your technology stack if you're in a certain department that's heavy code-driven, data engineering focus, data platform focus, then there would be a need for our solution in your, in your company today. Obviously, if you're you know, mm. a team of, uh, you know, I would say probably you know, 20 people at a startup, we're probably not the best fit for you, right? You probably don't even need us because right. your scale isn't at a point where you need that level of observability. But when you get to a point where you're mm. you know, using and having critical pipelines that you need to monitor no matter what happens, or sorry, no matter how much you scale, but you need to make sure certain critical pipelines are always operational. That would even be a use case to use us because even if you have a lower 
level of pipelines or low level of, of data sets that you're you're using, it's really important to make sure that those are always operational in a continuous manner. So from an ICP perspective, yeah. it, it really is really related to mm-hmm. the technologies that are in use, the personas around data platform, data engineering, and then the scale and complexity that you're using data for. Okay. So what, what, like, talk to us about some of your smaller, your smallest companies, like how many employees would they have? And then, you know, some of your bigger. Yeah. Companies. So uh, a company like, uh, let's say Trax Retail. So Trax Retail is a uh, company that's based out of, I think it's Singapore. Um, and what they do is they have a technology. It's a deep ML learning company or uh, ML learning models they have within their company. And what they do is is they have these models that are training a basically a bot to scan your inventory and tell you, hey, mm. to different stores, hey, inventory is low, it's high, there's missing issues here, missing issues there. All of that relates to all our technology that, that drives that. All of that technology is driven by data engineering and data science and data platform, right? And so if you think about mm-hmm. like the, the, uh, uh, what they use us for is as they add more and more and more ML learning models to what helps make the accuracy of these models better and better and better, they need something that's going to monitor as they layer in each additional pipeline or as scale more and more pipelines. And so Trax Retail will be an example of, you know, it's not a major, major Fortune 100, 1000 brand out there, but they're a startup that's growing at a, a decent clip. Uh, and it, it at least is a company that is at that scale where they're going to look to need us, right? We have other customers that are like, I can't name them, but like Fortune, you know, uh, 100 companies. That are, some of them are major banks. Some of them are major insurance companies. And their scale is different in the sense of what they have is a mixture of a lot of different technology. And so whereas Trax may have a very clear modern data stack approach to uh, the different pieces that they have within their, their, uh, their technology stack, their technical debt may be very low. Other companies we deal with that are more more enterprise and, and, and definitely within you know, the fortune 500, what happens is they have a lot of stuff that is either disparate from one another and it's creating a bunch of silos. And so we can tie into, mm. you know, certain teams that are a part of these major, major banks or major insurance companies to say, Hey, let's, ha- let's, ha- let's monitor this section of your data pipeline for this particular group. And then we look to expand into other groups. And so, that's more of a complex situation when you have more more tools and more uh, systems and applications in your data landscape versus somebody like Trax, which is pretty straightforward of the technology that they're using um, to, to have us sitting yeah. on top of that. Cool, cool. No, that's, that's uh, incredible stuff. And um, DataBand as a company started in 2018. So it's not like you guys have been around for, you know, X number of years. Like right. it's, it's a relatively new company. 40 something employees from what I see on, on LinkedIn. Yep. And then you guys got acquired by a major behemoth IBM. Talk to us a little bit about that process. Cause you kind of saw that whole thing unfold. Yeah. Yeah. So when, uh, back in 2021, we had our series a, so that was led by, um, Excel as the lead investors there. So we had about 14.9 million there and we had a, a few other, um, other investors as well that that uh, that were that, that came along with that, uh, Bessemer, uh, Blumberg Capital, Ubiquity, Differential, some of the other ones uh, that are out there. You can go to right. Crunchbase and, and see all of them. But Excel was one of the leaders, yeah. uh, <laughs> kind of um, uh, kind of in that space. And so when we were kind of going into 2022, you know, obviously after your Series A, you get your product going, you have really good market fit you look to bring on go-to-market. And that's when I was brought on uh, for the go-to-market. Well, during that time, the you know, leadership group was really looking at is, are we going we're going for a Series B or are we going to start to um, you know, raise more money? And IBM came and approached us for an M&A, or sorry, for, for an acquisition. And so that was really awesome to, for me to experience because... Me being a part of the exec team, I got to talk to all the people that were involved with the um, uh, with the acquisition group and the partner group. And with so, the deal. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was a, and, and then also a part of a, uh, uh, one of the most well-known brands out there, uh, in the world with IBM. Oh, right. So it was, for sure. that was my first time actually talking with, uh, at that level. And so mm-hmm. what was really cool was the story that the IBM is on and what they're, what they're marching towards in terms of their space and the, their spot in the data space is that, IBM is all about the data fabric and the data fabric is, is essentially here's all the, 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 here's like the architecture that you need to make sure you're a data driven company to be differentiated as, you know, as a company. Right. And with there, what they were looking at was how can data band play into this data fabric story? And so where we were able to slot in was to slot in really around where there was a gap between, <coughs> excuse me, that may be the hop and arrow there. There was a gap between uh, <laughs> some of the the quality standards that they were able to uh, monitor uh, within a particular uh, group of of the data they were actually looking at. I'm trying to keep this as like dumb as possible. And what we were able to do was kind of be the other side to that, which was we we're monitoring the data as it's coming in and in motion, and as as it's actually occurring versus versus when it's at a resting mm-hmm. state. And so a lot of times mm-hmm. you'll hear in the market like, hey, we need to shift left our development. We need to shift left our testing. We need to shift left our requirement. That's what the whole agile and DevOps thing, continuous integration, continuous delivery, all those jargon words I'm sure everyone's heard about uh, if you're in software. Um, yeah. we, that same concept is what we're doing, but on shifting left for data quality. So we're shifting left the idea to catch your data quality issues earlier rather than when they're about to be consumed. And so when they approached us, this was a story we were telling, which was, here's how we're differentiated from all these other observability tools that are out there in our, in our shift left approach that we actually have. And here's how we could fit into the data fabric. And so uh, it was fun mm-hmm. to be a part of. It was a fun to, you know, be, uh, be grilled on from the, from the, uh, acquisition board to see if we are actually knew what we were talking about. And uh, we passed, I guess, so they, I guess I gave a good presentation and uh, we, uh, we got acquired. Got acquired. Uh, what was the valuation, by the way? I don't know if this is on publicly available or shareable. So let me get the hot sauce. Do I get the hot sauce going here? So I have to get this going. Check out. Oh, all right. <laughs> Ring the bell, guys. Ring the bell. Ring the bell several times. All right. So uh, obviously, all right. obviously. Okay, okay. All right. Okay. Let me grab, grab this here. All right. Cheers. Here we go. Cheers. Okay. Cheers, IBM. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah, so obviously, um, I can't disclose uh, what the... When we raise our money, there was no public knowledge around the evaluation uh, for that. When IBM bought us, they did not disclose uh, how much uh, 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 database was purchased for. Um, if you look at other mm. observability tools that are out there in, in our competitive space that have raised Series B, Series C, Series D rounds, um, you know this valuation thing is really—it's really what they say, right? So, I mean, they're telling the market that they're unicorns, right? I think everyone's saying that they're a unicorn these days. Uh, maybe it's cooled down a little bit mm. uh, because of the market's yeah. been a little, yeah. little, little crazy lately. Um, but if you take that as a as a, uh, as a uh, as a I guess like a baseline to where we're at and when we raise our money, you can look to see that the market opportunity for data observability um, was very much hot, and that's why IBM uh, I think purchased us because uh, we were at a state where we were looking to really take off uh, in terms of VC funding, and uh, they saw us as a great fit into their data fabric story, and so. We obviously were really excited to to join that story. All right. Okay. Well, I'll be very careful asking anything related to the uh, the acquisition um, now moving forward. Yeah. No. No oh, more numbers. Stay away. So if stay I, clear I, of that. I don't want to get in trouble no here more, from no the CFO numbers. calling me and telling me. <laughs> okay. Let's let's get away from numbers. Let's talk about your area of expertise, which is GTM, go to market. Yep. You were hired to do to basically take DataBand, um, their software, and bring it to market. What kind of things were did you put in place? Like, what were the secrets? What were the drivers of, uh, of that brought DataBand to, to the level that they're at now? Like, 
Yeah. What kind of channels did you use? What was the strategy? Talk to us about that. Yeah. So we, you know, we, we use all the traditional channels that, that you can think of when it comes to marketing, but I'm going to, I'm going to hone in on one of them. So, I mean, obviously organic referral, uh, conferences we did, summits we did, paid search. I mean, all the same things you would think of that, that contributed to our go to market. What we did though was we hired a company to really jumpstart our rev ops process. So anyone that's in rev operations, like, marketing operations, it becomes very, very complex very quickly if you don't have structure in place. And so there's a company actually called Rev Partners, uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Brendan Tollison is the CEO over there. I used to work with him at Tricentis and that's exactly what they do. So what they do is, is they, they come in and they say, hey, you don't have a full-time RevOps person. Let us supplement that as RevOps as a service. And so we were using HubSpot at the time. Mm. Now we're obviously uh, moved over to IBM Systems, but at the time we were using HubSpot and what we needed to understand was like, where are all, where's all this coming from and what do we need to double down on which categories? And then how do we get some type of predictive uh, measurements for pipeline sourcing that we can actually measure? And so they came in, they mm-hmm. set up all of our uh, email nurture, all of our lead scoring, all of the um, uh, triggers in place for, for automation and then gave us dashboarding around like how are we tracking, you know, court, week to week, month to month, quarter over quarter, so we can understand how are we actually tracking to marketing source pipeline or where the channels are coming from. So what I would say, I say that as like a, as an encouragement to any marketer that's on the call right now. Like, I think the number one thing that you need to do when you're first setting up is, yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do, but you've really got to lay the foundation to make sure you can go really fast in the future. And so that was one mm. of the first things I did. The second thing I did was we revisited all of our messaging. So all of our messaging at the time and the website at the time was very much a, uh, I would say, nebulous at best of like what we actually did um, versus calling out specifically what we do, why it matters and why you should care. Pretty simple things, but it's hard to do with copy editing at times. So we brought in a new agency to redo our entire website, optimize it for SEO, optimize it for, um, uh, optimize it for engagement and uh, conversion. And we took a message that was, right. "Hey, we're not just a data observability company. We are a continuous data observability company. A shift left in an approach, and do the whole narrative design story where you compare and say, hey." This is what it's like before data ban. This is what it's like after data ban. This is like the current state of where you're at. This is right. where you need to get to. And so using those principles of telling a story and understanding exactly what we do, I wrote out an entire sales narrative for our sales force. That helps with conversion for sure. But really the two things I, I, I nailed down was getting a rev ops process so we can talk to the board and talk to uh, the, uh, I can communicate to the exec team how we're tracking in performance. And then two was um, uh, really gearing towards the messaging because because from messaging messaging. everything everything flows for it. Like, what are you going to be bidding on? What are you going? What content you going to be making? What's the web copy going to say? But if you don't have that down and you don't have that in a very tight, clean way, your marketing and sales team are completely lost and they don't know exactly what to be saying in front of customers. And so those were the probably the two main things we did. From a from a channel perspective, and this is really important too, when you're in a when you're in a company that's trying to establish their niche within a category like data observability, it's a brand new category. Yeah. You got to be pumping out content, and you got to be thinking about creative ways to get your awareness out there. Versus, like if I had joined mm-hmm. a company that was in uh, the 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 enterprise or application observability space pretty mature, right? Everyone kind of knows what that is now with companies like Datadog and New Relic. We're trying to really elevate our voice above uh, not just other competitors in the space. We're trying to even get a seat at the table for them to understand, hey, this is a new category. Here's how we fit into that category. And here's why you should care. Because what's interesting about our space is that there's a lot of similarities between data quality, data reliability, uh, data consistency, that where data observability is kind of this umbrella term that's over a lot of these things. And so 
Mm-hmm. You have to kind of get them to rethink what they've thought about the term data quality and let them know, yeah, data quality is an output of observability and reliability is an output of observability. You are too narrow in your lens of how you're viewing these things. Let us help you tell this overall platform story so you can basically get the things you want, but in a different way, a transformational way that you may have thought about in the past. And so content was mm. number our number one generator of all uh, hot MQLs that we have, which we call request demo. That's really all I care about. I don't care about anything else. Everything else is just a contact. Those were uh, some of the big uh, investments we made into um, really having a high velocity content engine that we did. Right. Okay. All right. So unpacking all of that. So so the the, the key points here to go to market was number one, getting your data right. Yep. You know, doing getting your rev ops as a data uh, as a data sure company. Data was yeah. As a data company, better make sure your data you is right. Your data. <laughs> <laughs> better measure your data correctly. So that's number one. Number two was your messaging, and then number three, just figuring out your different channels and having creative ways to push out the content. Those were like kind of your your three core pillars of your go to market strategy. Before we dive into each one of them, because I do want to have, I do have some questions about yeah. um, the different channels um, and also messaging as well. What about the ICP? When you joined, was the ICP very well defined when you first joined? No. And, and, and yeah, maybe you can talk yeah, a little it, bit about that. It was defined in the sense of in a very loose way. So when I create persona cards, I don't create them just to create them to say, hey, look, here's your persona. Go, go outbound in this persona. The persona cards are like our way to say, this is who our customer is and everything that we do should align back to how this profile is. And so what I did was I took the, I took the, you know, our ICP at the time was, it was basically this, it was basically data engineer, data platform, and they use these technologies. Like that was it versus going, okay, who are the primary secondary personas? What are the words they use in a in a uh, conversation? How do they explain certain things? How do they what, how do they talk about things where you can pivot in the conversation in certain directions, like in a decision tree? What are the top like concerns that they have as a team? And then what are the trigger points that would necessitate them to even be looking at us? So, for example, trigger points for us were cloud modernization, data engineering uh, inefficiency, and uh, modern data stack evolution. So like, if, you, if it fit into any of those conversations, if you're talking about those conversations, you'd be able to have a conversation about that. The other one is, the fourth one was more, which is very critical, is like, was there like an a incident that happened that was because of an unknown data problem that you didn't know about? So if you had any of these trigger points in a conversation with somebody, you knew that was going to be a good conversation. And then the other side of it was, what are the red flags of something where do not spend your time on these people? Do not spend your time on these, uh, these people that are either coming in inbound or outbounding because you're just going to be wasting your time. And so we blew up all of our persona cards into a, a not exhaustive, because I think that'd be too much, but in a more of a... Right. Here's like actually what this person sounds like, looks like. Here's how they talk. Here's what here's some quotes they they say to actually give them life versus a person on a card. So that ICP was a little bit challenging at the at times because I actually need to get to talk to some of our customers to uh, get that going. And so when you define this ICP, did you did you create different campaigns? Because yeah, you said you have a primary, secondary, and a, and a yep. third um, level cap, uh, ICP. Did you create different campaigns? Obviously, you had to create different messaging. Yep. You got to use different words. Did Did you create different pages for them on your website? So what we and so different ad campaigns and all that as well. Yeah. So what we did was here's what we did. We and and we use Asana for for everything to to counter. That's another tool that is really good. I I love Asana. It's like one of my favorite tools out there. Asana's great. You like Asana? Yeah. yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. But what we did was in each of the tactics that we did, we would put in who's the key persona. So we'd have the technical yeah. buyer, economic buyer, and C suite. We stayed away from C suite because. First of all, 
that's really hard to talk to. You're not going to, you're, you're going to need everybody a, selling, everybody's selling to the C-suite. Yeah. And right? then everyone's so. selling to C-suite and nobody is really selling to the C-suite because no, no C-suite person reads exactly. an ebook. Okay. They don't do that. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but they don't read ebooks. Um, but uh, what we did was we classified each content piece or activity that we're doing around that persona so that we knew when we were going to an event, creating a piece of content that was attached to that. So in the drop down for Asana, we had that in there. So some examples like, you know, for uh, some of the summits we went to last year, they were very end user data engineering focused. That was okay because we were doing a more bottoms up play than top down. Now that we're part of IBM, a lot of our plays are top down. You know, we're going to Gartner, we're going to uh, some of these Avanta events, we're doing more of these C-level conversations that, that then you can interject a conversation around data quality and data observability. But for us starting out, right. least passive resistance is to get people who are aware. People that are more aware of this topic are going to be the people that are actually in the day-to-day grind of bad data quality, bad reliability, and building content around that so that they can then take this to their manager. They can take this to um, you know, their executive. And how, how did you find... How did you find these groups or communities that were talking about it? Like, was it already was it already well defined before when you joined? If not, how did you approach that and, and finding? Yeah, finding so these, like, so groups? so when you look at how how like the majority of our MK and this is like really important people understand too. It when we were yeah. looking at where our source of hot MQLs were coming from, which are request demo, people that are more in a buy motion, possibly, or at least want to talk to sales about something, right? What we did was we looked at, okay, we saw that I think it was around referral was around, I believe, 10 to 15%, meaning that they can't, and those are some of our most hot, hot, uh, hot MQLs. They didn't come from a direct organic search, they either came from uh, referral from another website or direct. And so we found that a bunch of pages on Medium, which is weird, Medium, mm. Substack, uh, uh, Reddit. Substack makes sense. Yeah, Substack makes sense. Um, and then Slack communities. So what I'm trying to say is, if you Slack think about it, these are places that like people don't advertise on for the most part. Like, you can't really advertise on Medium. You can you can advertise on and Reddit, you don't, yeah, but you yeah. can't really and, advertise uh, but, on Medium. But even even Reddit, like you will get you will get downloaded and and right. you might get blocked and yeah, right, or you, you get kicked off or something that. like it's that, hard. right? Yeah. So yeah. what we had to do was cultivate either taking our content and posting on Medium on our page, or what we do is we'd reach out to people that are talking about these things and say, "Hey, we saw that you're talking about data observability. You want to slot in like." the data band does this. Hey, do you want to slot in uh, a snippet from us from data quality? And we, we, the amount of people that would come in and say, found you from a medium blog, or it would tell us it came from a medium blog or tell us it came from a guest post somewhere else. That was huge because it wasn't, they were coming directly from organic search to our stuff to, to land on our page to go. They were looking and found out some other way to then link back to us through a yeah. backlink to come to our website. So that's really right. important like for people to get out of just thinking about organic as organic search, but also what are the backlinks that you may be able to partner with other, other websites on or even blogs or medium posts where they're going to reference something that you actually uh, 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 solve for, with your product and engaging with them because you know they're going to be landing on that page and they're probably going to trust a third party air quotes to then get to your website. So that's, that's, that's one. The other one is like people, we found so many people on LinkedIn that are in this data community. There's a huge group of data creators that are on the the, the LinkedIn community. And so you right. know, recently we took, we had, you know, one, one, one social post recently got like 14,000 impressions recently. And it was because wow. we, we yeah. went and we found a bunch of these really awesome data creators that are creating really good content for the data community. And we just highlighted them. We said, Hey, here are the top 25 uh, data engineering influencers, data creators. Here's the top 25 uh, analytics engineers. Uh, and this is uh, through the, the data band uh, channel. Yeah. So uh, what, the, we, the what, what, what we would do is we, we basically would look on LinkedIn, look on other people's like how they interact with people and go, okay, 
This person here, this guy, Chad, he, he gets a lot of traffic to his LinkedIn. He, gets a, he has a lot of followers. A lot of people are talking about him. He writes a lot of cool stuff about data contracts. Let's, put, let's feature him on our blog for the yeah. community to know about him. And so then we would tag everybody on LinkedIn and we would get this community uh, recognition of, hey, there's all these people I should follow as a data engineer, or data analytics engineer. And, and you know, at the same time, they're also aware of data band because we're the one that put that list together. And so it was kind of a way, it was a double thing. It was get, make them aware of us, but also yeah. primarily make them aware of other people in their community that they can follow and get more education from. And then guess what? All these people that you tagged, they love it because you're yeah. giving them attention. And now they're going to be more likely to sh talk about data band to their community. Look, what I'm hearing from you is, okay, SEO is great. PPC is great. All these other channels are a must do and anyone can do it. Yeah. But community, community, community is, is what really, yeah. It's like the fuel. It's like, it's like oxygen to your fire. It's like yeah. it, that stuff can really, uh, can really blow up if you get community right. Yep. Um, is, is that, like, well, do you agree yeah, with that? Yeah. And you got to view it from this sense too. Like do, are people going to know more about data band by us doing that? Yeah. So there is like a little bit of a selfish thing of why we did it, but we did it under the way of like sure. viewing it through the lens of this, like, right. Like people want to be in community more and more. Let's help the community by highlighting certain people and that, that we're giving them value. And then if they view us as like, Oh, there's yeah. data band. I mean, look who they are. That's great. But give value first, like give value, give value, give value. Yeah. and then you'll, you'll reap the benefit of that. Uh, on the back end, right? Absolutely. Like that's that's what I would say. Stop talking Absolutely. about yourself yeah, and you start talking about other people, and you'll see that like you get way more engagement that way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, and in real life too, like who wants someone who just yeah. constantly talks about themselves talk about, all the yeah, time? Exactly. You want to talk about other people? Yeah. Yeah, talk about other people. Yeah, that's. I mean, I think we're pretty cool great. people, um, but I think you get annoyed about us talking about ourselves, you know, constantly. You know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so, like, if you were to say. You know the, the the top the top few channels. If you were to rank them, right? Because you said you got P SEO, you got PPC, yeah. You got, I guess, I don't know if community. Do, do you do you consider community as a channel? I would or, consider. Or, or, or so not? what I would do is I would consider. Uh, so number one is like content, right? So co content is the number it's one content. thing. That, yeah. that like that to me is by far the number one thing that you need to focus majority or spend on is especially in our space where you're trying to build a awareness around what you do. It's building it in a way that is through unconventional uh, channels. And so search, obviously, yes, hundred percent. Second is where are the communities of where their, your team, your, your, your audience is going to tap into that. And then right. third is yeah. kind of like the social and podcast play that we have, which is, hey, like yeah. I just interviewed somebody. Her name is Madison. She's awesome. She's an analytics engineer. Reached out to her. I said, hey, uh, you want to come on the podcast? Just talk about talk about what you do, right? Well, she's going to then take that, post about it on her LinkedIn, and she gets the, her personal brand goes up in the data community, and our name also goes up at the same time. So it's a win-win. Yeah. And those are ways that yeah. you can tap into your audiences you don't have access to by doing the podcast, doing the tags on social talk, talk talking about yourself, talking about other people. That's a really good way to bring awareness up besides the traditional, you know, stuff that's not really at the, the at the, 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 the scale that we we're at the time, which is like, you think about, Oh, PR and analyst relations and that stuff. It's like, yeah, that'll, that's a time that, that you need to focus on that. But at the time we were, where we were at data band was we're a small company. We're just trying to grow. We're just trying to get our name out there. And those are the easiest, easiest tactics to do there. So, so how much do you guys spend? Um, let's talk about budgets a little bit. Like how much do you guys spend on content versus any other channel like PPC? Like, yeah. So PPC and I'll, I'll talk in like percentages. So PPC was a total of probably about 15% of our budget. Content was roughly like 40% of our budget. The events that we went to and we did, that was probably 30% of our budget. And then everything else was technology, okay. operations, things like that. 
the reason why events are such a big, obviously events are a big chunk of your money, but the reason why we go to events isn't necessarily for automatic lead capture, right? Like you see a lot of people that go to these events that are expecting to walk away with, Oh, look, I got 200 leads. Most of them are insanely yeah, garbage. Exactly. They're complete garbage. Right. Exactly. But what we do yeah. is we go and we, we said, okay, we're going to sponsor data council, subsurface, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, guess what? We know that the people that are already in pipeline are probably going to be at that event or that we know they're going to be that at those events. And so mm. what we use at that time, what we were using a uh, conference spend for was really a account-based marketing play to only go after the people that we were already in our pipeline. So it wasn't a net new mm. account-based marketing thing, obviously, but it was, hey, we no. know the accounts are going here. We know that they're already engaged in the sales cycle. Let's use this as an opportunity to further... It's like our, nurturing. Yeah, it's further to nurture. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. That, and then you get into the multi-touch attribution model, blah, blah, blah. But that's like an example to say like, hey, marketing sponsored this event. We were there and we moved it on with sales. Like sales was there as well. We were able to further the opportunity. Look, there's all these buzzwords, nurturing, oh, pipeline, yeah. like all these buzzwords. But at the end of the day, especially with B2B, it's just a relationship. Yeah. You're dealing with another person, right? Yeah. And the other person, they might like what you're doing, but you might not be the only... Chances are you're, my, you're in a space where there's two or three other competitors. Yeah. Why would they choose you guys over those other competitors? It's just down to relationships. Right. Would I, if I'm going to be paying this money anyways, why do, I, w- I would rather pay to work with someone that I like. Right. Right. It's just relationships. And it, it, that, it, that's just like the fundamental. Okay. So um, I, I know we're coming up against time. Um, your career is, it, it's incredible what you guys are doing at, at data band and, and, and everything. Um, some of the listeners here might be like, wow, like I, I just wish I can, I, I wish, I wish I can think of all these things that Ryan thought about, like, and I wish that I can be a better CMO and all this stuff. What kind of tips would you give to these marketers that maybe are more, I wouldn't say junior, but intermediate and maybe they're a senior marketer and they want to get up to the CMO, the strategic level. What kind of tips would you, would you give them to overcome that hump? So one, don't be afraid of numbers. Like if you are, let's say a product marketer or even a content marketer and at, at your aspirations are to run a team one day, you got to be in the numbers. So like, don't be afraid of the numbers. Like go talk. If you have somebody in your group that is, you know, you know, I, I my last company, I had this uh, woman, her name is Ellen Kinley. She was amazing. She was our, the chief transformational officer and she was over all of rev ops and marketing ops and she basically brought all the numbers up to the board. And so I could sit with her and talk to her about like, what, why are we showing certain numbers here and there? And what's the story we're telling around mm-hmm. these numbers? So like one is like, get comfortable with the numbers. I think two is like, oh, like listen on LinkedIn, but be quick to call BS. Meaning that, and you and I talked about this, there's a lot of good information on LinkedIn. There's a lot of crap on there. And so go to yeah. g- find somebody that you know has been there, done that. And bounce ideas off of them because there's a lot of snake oil, I think, going on LinkedIn and marketing and sales. Everyone's trying to be, I'm not saying everyone's like this, but everyone's trying to be a coach these days and everyone's trying to do thought leadership and whatever. Some of it's really good, some of it's really bad, and some of it's very distracting. And so, like, take those ideas, sure, jot them down, but then go and talk to somebody that has either done this before or has made it work or had done it and it was completely a complete failure and get insight from them. A big uh, example of that is like ABM, the ABM craze, right? Like that went insane for probably three, four years. Now it's kind of really died off now. And a lot of ABM companies are having to rethink how they're doing everything now. And so you look on LinkedIn, oh, this company did this, this company did that. And we bought into their Kool-Aid and actually that was the wrong Kool-Aid to buy into. And so just, I would definitely like talk to somebody that's done in the past. I have past CMOs that I used to work for that I still talk to to this day. And I just ask them, Hey, is this, you know, a viable thing or not? So, and then the last thing I say is like, definitely look for repeatable templates that you can use that at least gets you as a start of a baseline. So product marketing Alliance, I think is a really good resource for everybody to take a look into these podcasts like you, Simon, like these are good podcasts, but look into like, create your own little toolkit of things that you know, work really well and save them mm. so you're not starting from scratch every time. 
every time I start a new messaging conversation, I know exactly what template to go to. Um, every case study I'm going to do, I know exactly which one to go to. Every pipeline inverted funnel, I know exactly which one to go to so that uh, I can at least get started. Doesn't mean you can't adjust them, but you know, it really gets to go in there. So yeah, so yeah. The, the three, you know, getting the numbers, have a, have a mentor you can bounce things, ideas off of, and then also get some templates to help you jump jumpstart you uh, in, your, in your next yeah. phase of your career. It just sounds like you're just always, you are always curious and you're always learning. And I think that's that uh, from what I'm hearing from your answers and also you're so data driven, you're looking at the numbers all the time. You're just constantly learning because marketing changes every month, every two months, yeah. something, something changes. So if you're not curious, if you're not constantly learning, you're probably not going to stay on top of, of everything. So Ryan, thank you so much for jumping on. Um, yeah, man. Incredible what has what has happened with Databand. Excited to hear uh, to get you back on maybe later on in the year or yeah. next year to hear about like an update on Databand. And uh, man, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you want to learn more about marketing, just hit that subscribe button and check out all the other videos we have with CEOs, CMOs, and founders. We post weekly here, so this way you won't miss any future episodes. Also. You can leave me a comment down below on what you think about this episode and also what else I can do or ask to make the show more fun for you. See you later.